We got a special guest preacher for you tonight. He's world renowned. I'll take that prophecy. Come on now. Well, you know, I got up this morning because my alarm was going off and I got happy because it was telling me that it was the day to go to the house of the Lord. Come on, some. I got excited when I found out I was coming to the Ben Church tonight, the one and only. And we know it's the one and only. When, when we looked at the marketing for the name, there's no other church with the name The Bend. And I'm just prophesying that this church right here is just going to be one of many that we're going to plant all across this state. Can I get somebody to agree with me? Amen. Well, first of all, let's go ahead and honor Pastor Shane. Put your hands together for our pastor and honor him. He's out ministering this week in Colorado, and uh, I just want to say thank you to him because, as always, I love to have an opportunity to speak to y'all, and it's been a good little minute. I was wondering if y'all had forgot if I could preach or not, and so I thought I'd come back and let you know, and So, but we're going to dial it back. We don't want to embarrass Pastor Shane now, and uh, y'all don't tell him that when he comes back. I, I still want to keep my job, so y'all don't tell him that. But, uh, well, we're going to pick up in the book of Revelation chapter 6 tonight, so y'all can go ahead and turn over there. And while you're doing that, I'm going to recap really quickly everything that we've learned so far. So, Pastor Shane has been uh, preaching over the last several weeks about the book of Revelation. We started in chapter 1 with the introduction of the book, and it's talking of the things that were. Then we moved into chapters 2 and 3 where we talked of things that are, talking about the seven churches and what they are doing from the time of John all the way up to present day. We then moved in to chapters 4 and 5, and from chapter 4 all the way to the end, it's preaching about the things to come. And so he talked about in chapters 4 and 5 the praise and worship that is going on in heaven around the throne room. And I get excited because I'm the worship leader here, I get excited when we read Revelation 4 and 5, and I just think in my mind a sea of people standing around the throne of God, and everyone is shouting and clapping and dancing and giving glory to God for all the things that he has done. It just gets my heart all excited. And so we could have stayed on that chapter for a month. And, uh, but anyways, now we're coming into Revelation chapter 6. Now, leading into Revelation chapter 6, coming off of the end of Revelation chapter 5, and there's a little bit of a ring going on in this mic, uh, somewhere in, in like the mid-highs kind of area. But in Revelation chapter 5, you have God the Father is sitting on the throne, and he has in his hand a scroll that is sealed with seven seals. And it says that the elders in heaven are looking around and they're crying out, is there anyone who is worthy to open up the seals and to read from the scroll? Then you have the lamb that is slain before the foundations of the earth. That lamb comes up, he takes the scroll, and he begins to break the seals off. Now each one of those seals uh, turns into a judgment, which we're going to deal with the first four of those seals tonight. We're going to talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Okay, so we're going to go into some deep waters, and I I promise you, you're going to want to write this stuff down, because I've got about 17 pages of notes up here, and uh, I'm not going to be able to stop on everything, and unlike Pastor Shane, I'm actually going to get through my notes tonight. (laughs) Pastor Shane passes out notes, and we stick with them for about three weeks, but I'm going to cram it in here and do my best to get through it all, but coming Off of that scroll with the seven seals, I want to talk on that just for a moment. So Pastor Steve, what was that, two weeks ago, he also talked about that scroll and how it was possibly a scroll that contained the judgments that were coming on those who had persecuted the church. Pastor Shane came last week and spoke about how he believes it is a type of will and testament or a deed for the dominion of the earth held in God's hand. I personally believe that it's a mixture of the two. So scrolls on the inside of a scroll 
it was very smooth. On the outside of the scroll, it was rough. So usually, you would not write on the outside of a scroll. But there are some instances where you would. Those instances would be treaties or deeds or different things like that. The promise and the good things of those treaties would be written on the inside of the scroll, but the judgment on those who tried to do something illegitimately or to, to, to take away the land, take away the promise, punishments were written on the rough outside of the paper. So I think it's both. I think it's both. Another really cool detail, as, as, as Pastor Shane spoke on this the other night, I, I asked him if he thought the same as me on this, but he has the seven seals. And so I was thinking to myself, who is it that would be worthy enough to seal the scroll with God? As Pastor Shane said last week, you would have to take that scroll to the city gates because the city gates back in ancient Near Eastern times was basically like a courtroom. And then you would have seven elders, seven prominent men who would seal these wax seals with their signet ring. Now that number seven is obviously, most people know it as the number of completion. But what a lot of people don't realize is all throughout your Bible, there are different times where you see different things like in Revelation. Uh, I believe they'll have a slide here. In Revelation, you have seven uh, seals, you, you have seven eyes, you have seven horns. Um, then also in the book of Zechariah, you have seven lamps, seven lips, seven eyes. And in the book of Zechariah, it talks about these being the seven spirits of the Lord. And then in Isaiah, it talks about, it details the seven spirits. It is the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of exhortation, the spirit of strength, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So here's what happened in heaven. God made a deed for the dominion of the world, and because he's God and there's nobody like him, and there's nobody beside him, y'all are real quiet in this Pentecostal. I'm talking about the king of the universe and how he sits high and looks down low and there's nobody beside him. So can't nobody else seal the scroll but himself. So the seven spirits of the Lord sealed the scroll for the Lord. I can tell I've already, we, we done dived in way too deep. Y'all put y'all's floaties on because we gonna get into it tonight. Now, so these seven seals are being broken off. And the first four we're going to deal with tonight. So we're going to come here to Revelation chapter 6. And let's read starting in verse 1. It says, Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures call out as with a voice of thunder come and I looked and there was a white horse say white horse, white horse. its rider had a bow say a bow. a bow a crown was given to him say a crown. a crown and he came out conquering and to conquer when he had opened the second seal I heard the second living creature call out come and out came another horse, bright red. Say red. red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another, and he was given a great sword. Say great sword. great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come. And I looked, and there was a black horse. Say black horse. Black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales. Say scales. In his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a day's pay, and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come. I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Say, Pale green. Pale. Its rider's name was Death. And Hades was following after him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. Now, Pastor Shane touched on each of these very lightly the other night, but I'm going to take a moment and we're going to do a little bit more detailed on these. But the first thing I want to say is, tonight you've got two choices. 
When it comes to the book of Revelation, you can either repent or you can rejoice. Because you're either in the kingdom or you need to get in the kingdom. So you can either repent or you can rejoice. You know what? Let me say that. When I say rejoice, I just need y'all to make a, a, a joyful note. You can either <laughs> repent or... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're going to do that a couple times tonight just because I like to hear it. So the white horse, we're going to get into the white horse. Now, as Pastor Shane said the other night, this is not to be mistaken with Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Uh, in Revelation 19, you do see... Christ riding a white horse, but there are some differences. In, in Revelation chapter 6, this right, uh, white horse rider, he is wearing a crown, but it is a Stephanos crown. This is what is called the victor's crown. This is a crown that would be given to a general or a war leader or even sometime uh, athletes like wrestlers or gladiators, but it was people who dealt violently, okay? Okay. So he's wearing a victor's crown and he has a bow. Now in Revelation 19, Jesus is wearing a diadem, which is a crown of royalty, and he has a long two-edged sword. Amen? So this, this white horse rider, we can identify him as the Antichrist. I believe we can. And if that's the case, then the Antichrist, according to Daniel chapter 9, is going to set up peace on the earth for seven years. And halfway through that, there's going to be something is going to happen, and then chaos is going to break out all over the place. War is going to happen all over the place, and you're going to begin to see each of these four horse take their ride across the earth. So, but what is cool about these each of these riders, John, because of the culture and the background that he was in, in that day, as he is seeing these visions, it's probably bringing some things to mind for him. And let me bring up one of the things that he probably thought. So the white horse rider, what could John have been thinking about at that time? Emperor Nero was an emperor over the, the Roman Empire. And I'm not saying that Nero was the Antichrist, but I want to show you how it was a type and shadow of a type of Antichrist. As Pastor Shane has, has said many times, Satan doesn't know when the end is going to be, but each generation he raises up someone who could potentially take that position. And so immediately after the church is birthed, rises up this man who brings horrendous, terrific persecution to the church. Well, the first portion of his reign started in peace. But then something changed in Nero, and he began to go on a tirade of killing his friends, killing family members, killing politicians. He was a perpetuator of sodomy and tyranny and persecution against the, the Christians. In fact, there's the famous story of the city of Rome burning, and it's just coincidentally that as the fires were going down, that one of his friends in the Senate had a fire that started up in the garden of his house and it consumed the city again, consumed up to two-thirds of the city. That number two-thirds is prophetic because later on in the book of Revelation, you see that two-thirds of the earth is being consumed with pestilence yeah. and war and famine and everything else. Now listen, listen to me. I I'm, I'm, I'm promise this is all going to make sense. So Nero starts out with peace, but then something changes and he goes on this tirade to the point to where the Senate actually kicks him out of the empire. They had to get the Praetorian Guard to banish Nero from the empire. Now, there were two rumors at the time of what happened to Nero. There was one rumor that he killed himself by way of the sword, and then there was a second rumor that he had left to go to the land of the Parthians, and that he was going to rise up an army from the Parthians and come back to Rome and take his vengeance and take back the, the throne. Now, here's some things about the Parthians that makes really good sense. They were known for their white horses. They were known for their archers, for their bows and arrows. Their leader, Seleucus, 
was nicknamed Nikator, N-I-K-A-T-O-R, and that name means the victor. So you have the white horseman who is riding on a white horse, he is carrying a bow, and he is wearing a victor's crown. So John, as he is seeing this vision, is possibly in the back of his mind thinking the Antichrist is possibly already here. The Parthians, and we'll get into this a little bit later, the Parthians were, were originated down in the lower part of Iran, just on the other side of the Euphrates River, which is another heavy part of the, the, the judgments of God that are going to come later on where you have an army who crosses over the Euphrates River after it dries up. So there's several things that are correlating to what he could have thought when he heard this white horseman. Now, obviously, Nero didn't come and do those things. But I don't believe that these things are coincidence so closely together. All of the descriptions are just right there beside each other. But in all throughout our history, as I said earlier, you have all of these leaders like Hitler, Saddam Hussein, uh, Mussolini, Mao, Genghis Khan, all, every generation has had someone who comes up and tries to take this seat. And I think that what we can learn from this is that there is a pattern that is probably going to take place with the Antichrist where the beginning of his reign is going to be very peaceful, things are going to be good, and then all of a sudden something is going to change. And I personally believe it's going to change so much that people are going to try to push him out of his position. And once he's pushed out of his position, he will rise up with an army and begin to wreak havoc on the world. So, y'all still with me? All right. Now, going on to the red horse. Say red horse. red horse. This horse represents war. The color of its coat represents the blood that is going to be spilled from its ride. It says that he was given a great and mighty sword. Now, there were different types of swords that were given uh, to the Roman soldiers. You had everything from a small dagger to a long sword of about 19 to 20 inches. But this particular sword was very heinous. This sword came out, and to the very end, the very tip of it, it curved up just ever so much. And it was literally just something like the size of your fingernail little curve at the very end of the, of the blade. Roman soldiers were taught when they plunged it into their enemy to turn the hilt of the sword and to pull it out to maximize the amount of damage that would happen. So when we're talking about warfare going on all across the world, we're talking about something that is heavy, heinous, terrifying. It is intended to cause the most amount of pain as possible. Now we go on to the black horse. Say black horse. The color black is associated with famine. And also you have him carrying a set of scales. Now the scales uh, were an allusion to in the times of famine, people would eat bread by its weight. So like you have in the story of Joseph when he's in Egypt and his brothers have to come down and buy grain from him. They were having to weigh out the food and the rations according to, to uh, the amount of money that they were giving. And you even see um, that it talks about how the uh, wheat and the barley will be worth a day's wage. So you will, the, the famine will begin to hit the world so heavily, you will work all day long to just get this small portion of food. Now, one of the things that Pastor Shane pointed out was that the oil and the wine are spared. Again, this could be an allusion to something that John had already seen in A.D. 70 when Titus, the general, had ransacked Jerusalem, but he spared the olive trees and the grapevines. And so these things were precious commodities. So here you see that the poor are becoming very destitute and, and starving while the rich are growing richer and richer. Now this is where it's going to get real good. So say pale horse. Now, in many of your, of your Bibles, it'll say pale horse or ashen horse, uh, and some of them will say pale green. But um, as I studied this, 
the, the Greek word is, is, is chloros, as Pastor Shane said last week. It means pale green, like a sickly green. And I began to think to myself, I don't think I've ever seen a green horse unless somebody painted one for St. Patrick's Day. So I began to look up, are, is there such thing as a, as a green horse breed? And there is a breed called Blue Roan, R-O-A-N. Roan is an equal dispersion of white hairs mixed in with whatever color you have. So if you have red with roan, you get something called strawberry roan. Well, here you have something called blue roan, which on the screen here, it has this slightly bluish, green, gray kind of tint. And I've actually seen some pictures where the green is so prominent, it almost looks like a dark, dark, mossy green almost like just be, just above black, but has this hue of green to it. So this is probably the type of horse that he is talking about, a blue roan horse. Now, this horseman says that his name is Death, and hell is coming after him. I personally believe that this fourth horse is just a summarization of the other three horses. There was a question last week of whether or not these seals are being broken off slowly or if they're all happening at the same time, I believe that they're all happening at the same time. For one, because you can't read what's on the scroll until all the seals are broken. But I believe that this last horse is a summarization of the other three, and part of the reason why is because at the end of the description, it says that they are led to kill by way of pestilence and war and famine, and it, it, it names out the previous three anyways. Now, if you move over to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, at the very beginning of that chapter, it says that there are four angels standing at the four corners of the earth and they are holding back the four winds of heaven. And one of the angels comes to them and says, do not let these, these, these winds go to inflict damage on the earth until the servants of God have been sealed on their forehead. All right? So these four winds are being held back until a certain time. Now, as Pastor Steve said whenever he preached a couple weeks ago, these judgments that are about to come with the four horsemen are intended not necessarily for the saints, but for those who have persecuted the saints. Okay? Okay? So we have these four horsemen, and these four horsemen are represented as the four winds of the earth. Now, flip over to Zechariah chapter 6. The rest of the time, we're going to walk through the Old Testament, and I'm going to show you that these four horsemen are used all throughout the Old Testament. Now, in Zechariah chapter 6, you have four chariots. Each of these chariots are pulled by different colored horses. And those horses are red, black, white, and some of your translations will say dappled or spotted or sorrel, S-O-R-R-E-L-L. -L. But again, I believe that it is blue roan. Now, the reason why I believe that is because I studied a peer-reviewed article of a man who actually did studies on the genetic strands of horse breeds that were in the ancient Near East at this time. And the translation for this word almost always goes back to a blue roan horse. So when you read Zechariah chapter 6, the same four colors of horses are found in Revelation chapter 6. And also, Zechariah asks the angel who is showing him this vision, what are these four things? And he says that they are the winds of heaven, that they are being held back, and that they are impatient to be let go on the earth. Now, every time these horses are found, or every time these winds are found, it is God sending judgment on those who have persecuted the church. But let me give you some background to what's going on in Zechariah. The people of God had gotten estranged from him. They had gotten into sin. They had gotten into idolatry. They had forgotten their first love. 
So God used the nations around Israel to bring his people back to him. And then he punished them for the part that they played in the persecution. And I got good news for you because as I was studying this, I felt the Holy Spirit say this to me. God will send persecution into your life if you are estranged from him. If you're in here tonight and you're lost, if you're watching on the, on the cameras here, if you're lost and you're wondering why your life is going to hell in a handbasket, if you're wondering why your job is always failing, if you're wondering why your family's always falling apart, if you're wondering why your friends are always stabbing in your back, it's because God loves you and he is using them to bring you back to himself. The fact that you are going through hell when you are in a lost state is the grace of God trying to bring you back to him. But the things that persecuted you to bring you back to him, he then judges. So we've got some people in here like Jerry and Sam and some others who have had alcohol and drug addictions. Those things were used to bring you back. I actually heard his testimony the other night. In the midst of him being high, he heard the voice of the Lord speak to him that the devil was coming after him. The persecution that he went through, all of the rough times that he went through, brought him back to God. And now he is the one who is breaking the chains off of people who are caught up in drugs and alcohol and addiction. Well, I guess I'm the only one that really got Y'all ain't near as happy. I'm telling if you've got something in your life that is holding you back and hurting you, it's God trying to get you to hand that thing over so that you can have dominion over it and not become the attacked, but the attacker. That's the whole point of getting saved. He brings you out of sin so that we can go out and push back sin further. So you have these, these seven, uh, uh, these four horsemen in Revelation chapter six, they're called the four winds. Then here in Zechariah chapter six, you have the four chariots and they're called the four winds of heaven. Now there's a couple of other places throughout the scriptures where you see the four winds. As I just said, you see it in Zechariah chapter six, but if you move over to Jeremiah 49, you're also going to see the four winds of heaven. And I believe, this is my personal opinion, that every time you see the four winds of heaven moving like this, it is the judgments of God. It is these four horsemen working in one way or another. And they always come when the people of God have been persecuted and he is using them to punish the persecutors. So let's look here in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 36. You have Elam is being punished and essentially destroyed by the four winds of heaven. It's also interesting that Elam is a place that was known for its cavalry, its white horses, and its bows, just like the Parthians. In fact, the Parthian empire started around the same area as Elam. So here again, you have, some, you have this connection Y'all ain't with me. Let me. Y'all are falling asleep on me. So, but here in Jeremiah, God has used the nations around Israel and Judah to persecute them in order to bring them back to him. And then he punishes them for the part that they played. So again, as I said in the beginning, you've got two choices tonight. You can either repent because you are a part of the system that is persecuting the church, whether it is apathetically or aggressively, if you are not a part of the kingdom, you are a part of the system that is persecuting the kingdom. So you can either repent or you can rejoice. Yes, yes, yes. Now, Ezekiel chapter 37. This is where it gets, this right here just tickled my little heart. Ezekiel chapter 37. He goes and he sees a valley of dry bones. He sees a valley of dry bones and it says that the four winds of heaven begin to blow and it stirs these bones up. Yeah. 
and they begin to come together. And then Ezekiel prophesies to them for skin to come and stitch them back together. The Lord speaks to Ezekiel and says, take two sticks, tie them together and hold them in your hand. And he says, when people ask what these two sticks represent, he said, tell them that they are the nation of Israel and Judah, that I am bringing them together as one nation again, and never again will they be separated. Never again will they live. In so hold on, hold on, hold on. So hold on. Ezekiel didn't realize what he was seeing. This vision was prophetic to the time that he's in, but it is also a type and shadow of the resurrection of the saints. It's a, re it's a type and shadow of the resurrection of the dead in Christ. The four winds, just like the four horsemen, are going to be released onto the earth. Right at the time when these four horsemen are going on the earth, that wind is going to blow together the bones of those who have died in Christ on the earth. He's going to resurrect them and the ones who had died in Christ will be brought together with the ones who live and remain, as 1 Thessalonians says, and never again will we be separated. Never again will denomination separate us. Never again will race or creed or language or anything else keep the body separated. And forevermore, he is going to reign with us. So these four winds were coming just after the people of God had been persecuted and this judgment as it is coming is putting the body of Christ back together. Lord have mercy. All right. One more thing. Let's go one more place. Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 depicts a vision of four winds of heaven stirring up the waters of the great sea. Now, out of the waters come four beasts. Now, again, this number four, every time you see the number four, it, it connotates totality. So just as you have the number seven, that means completion. It, it's more of like the completion of a task. But the number four is a number of totality, as in this is the boundary. This is as far as you can go. Now everything has to stop. So you have the four winds of, of judgment are stirring up and there's four beasts that come out. Now, I believe, again, these four beasts are comparable to the four horsemen that you see in Revela Revelation chapter 6 because one of them is probably the Antichrist. It is the fourth beast. It says that this beast comes out and that there are ten horns on its head. And out of those ten horns, one of them rises above the others. Well, according to Daniel chapter 2, there are 10 nations that the Antichrist will reign over. Am I going too fast? I'm sorry. No, 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 no. So there's 10 nations that the Antichrist is going to reign over, and then he will rise up above them, and it says that this beast has this horn with an arrogant mouth on its head, and then you begin to see uh, that the, the Bible says that the throne of God comes down from heaven... And the ancient one is seated on there and he descends with all of his angelic host. And then Jesus comes to the anointed one and presents himself before him. And to him is given all dominion and glory and kingship and all people and nation and languages to serve him forever and ever. And his dominion is everlasting. At that time, this fourth beast is destroyed. So, you've got two choices tonight. I want y'all to stand up in this place. You've got two choices tonight. As I said before, you can either repent or you can rejoice. But I want my prayer team to come down here because I, I, I preach this word specifically to be evangelistic. Come on down here. Prayer team, come on down. And as I've been saying throughout the whole message, you're either one of those two people. You're either in the kingdom or you're not. And tonight I've given you plenty of reasons why you need to be a part of it. There's a judgment coming and it's going to be horrible. But God is using 
even today, all of the persecution that is coming against the church today, all of the uprising of martyrs in the last 100 years all across the world, the uprising of, of abortion and the LGBT movement and uh, gender, identity, all of these things are coming against the church because God is trying to get his people ready. And so if you're in this place tonight and you do not believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, I want you to come down here and find one of these people to pray with. I don't want anybody to bow your heads or close your eyes. I want you to be bold about it. I'm going to count to three. And if you need Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, I want you to come down to this place right now. One, two, three. Is there anybody? God's calling out to you. Amen. Well, it looks like we're all ready. Well, there's one, only one other choice for us to do tonight. That's to rejoice. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Well, look, church. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning. I pray that this week is the best week of your life. Let the Lord look upon you. Let his face be about you and his countenance be around you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Go have a good week, y'all.